All right, welcome to episode three of the Mad Men pod. Last week was pretty fun, wouldn't you guys say? Oh, yeah. That was a good time. It was a good time. Well, this week we have a great lineup of duds and studs. We're also taking a deep dive into uh, the French women's soccer team campaign. Really, really cool ad that went viral this week. Uh, And then we have some uh, fun brands to watch. Uh, Celine, you're still traveling. Where are you at now? I'm in France, man. You talk about France women's soccer, dude. It's hyped up here. So I'm in France enjoying uh, the nice wine and uh, the uh, beautiful weather out here. Nice. You got to give us your take on that once the beer does that deep dive. Um, so to all of our Pioneer subscribers, thank you so much for all the great feedback you've given. Um, and thanks for uh, you know subscribing on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We're seeing the numbers go up, which is really exciting. Um, my wife still hasn't uh, subscribed, so we're on episode three of that. And, um, you know, we'll go ahead and get started, but I'm your host, Adil. I'm Celine. And I'm Samir. Let's get started. Men go mad. He's gone mad. Mad men. Yo, mad. The man's mad. Mad men. I'm mad. All right, guys. Are you guys Starbucks junkies? Dude, I am a overly coffee connoisseur, so Starbucks does not hit my palate. Unless it's forced <laughs> as a location. I go for the, the local coffee chain if I can. I'm a local really? coffee chain guy if I can. Yeah, I do like the idea of going to a local coffee shop, but I'm slowly just like cold brew out of the fridge and put a little bit of creamer in here and there, but um, I don't do Starbucks anymore. But we are going to talk about Starbucks' new campaign for Oleato. The new line of uh, coffee beverages combines Starbucks Signature Blend with a spoonful of Partana Cold Press Extra Virgin Olive Oil. Very fancy. Starbucks has been teasing this campaign for a few months that we've all we've all seen, and uh, now it's finally here. The campaign is called The Power of Olive Oil, and it's all about how olive oil can enhance the flavor and texture of coffee. Starbucks is even offering free samples at many of the stores, uh, and they're super confident in this uh, in the product quality and the launch. And they're really, really excited at a corporate level. Uh, what do you guys think? Is this going to be a dud or stud of a launch? Look, I'm a coffee connoisseur. I've got about seven different ways to make coffee in my house. Adding olive oil has never hit the trend market. I'm rolling gear up right now. Um, I don't see olive oil at any of the coffees or offers here. Even the Starbucks over here isn't. I think they're trying to add more syrups. They're going to increase a little excuse to charge more. I mean, you see all these uptakes on these mixed drinks that are on, on TikTok that end up being like ten dollars a coffee. That's all this is. This is a a move to add more pricing to the coffee, charge you more for the coffee, and give you a mediocre product. I think this is a dud move. Uh, so then I go long ways with it. I, mean, I don't know, man. Yeah, I I have a I have a hot take, hot question to ask you guys. What if I told you that the Oleato Oleato is not a new product launch, but it's rather a branding campaign? Like, let's be real, coffee itself has been relatively boring for, for many years. What has made coffee interesting is flavor. And Starbucks has been the king of flavor innovation when it comes to coffee. We know the legendary pumpkin spice latte, toasted white chocolate mocha, my personal favorite, vanilla sweet cream cold brew. Do you guys remember the pink drink, the unicorn frappuccino? And all of those variations of flavor have all been sort of copied by some form by competitors. And coffee flavors can always be copied, but coffee craft is an art that cannot be copied. And Starbucks really had to reinforce that it's not just a leader in its flavors, but it's a leader in coffee. So playing into that that brand position that they know how to do coffee, uh, they by inspiring to be the world's leader in premium coffee, both in the the art and the science. Like I, I think I think that's what we've seen from Starbucks Reserve, right? When we think about the purpose of that is being the premium connoisseur craft coffee expert is where Starbucks wants to be. And that's what Starbucks Reserve was. This Oleato is just a, an extension of that, right? Like it's, we're now being able to get that craft coffee experience in areas where you are not able to have Starbucks Reserve drinks. And Starbucks is the one that's getting credit for bringing this premium Italian specialty coffee to the US. It's something you'll never see Dunkin' do. It's nothing you'll never see Pete's do, right? This is a very true on brand to Starbucks to really push the innovation in coffee. Uh, and I feel like it was really smart. I, I think it's a stud thing. I think it's going to help them elevate their brand premium levels, a, a premium level into coffee even higher. I think it's something that's breaking them even further away from competitors. Um, Starbucks has always won because of its massive store count and its its digital loyalty experience and all those amazing things. 
but now they can proudly say that they're bringing some innovation to the actual craft of coffee. Um, whatever that was really doesn't matter. I don't, I don't necessarily care that it's olive oil in it. The, what's important, what's interesting is that they're pushing coffee to become more interesting again. Uh, and I, I think it's a stud thing. I don't think this, the product is going to go very far, but I think it speaks a lot about Starbucks as a brand. It's a really good take, Samir, because uh, I don't uh, I don't expect Starbucks to um, make this a big part of their menu. This is definitely not going to be uh, take up huge real estate on their menu. They do may have to bring a lot of attention to it. Uh, not so much because it's going to be a game changer of a product. They do a lot of research and development in keeping coffee interesting. I mean, our local coffee shops that, you know, Salim, Samir, and I go to, we, we, you don't expect these guys to, um, to do the R and D that, uh, that Starbucks is doing. Another take would be Starbucks is kind of taking this as like, um, like a form of tourism, right? Like, I mean, the people that go to Starbucks and they're not traveling the world, uh, as much, right? Like for them going abroad is Cancun, right? For many of the Starbucks, uh, uh, connoisseurs. They're going to Cancun as their, uh, or, you know, any kind of all-inclusive resort. So they're taking, they're getting these flavors from around the world to be a, um, a way of tourism uh, and to be this kind of, this little, uh, to give people that edge that, oh, this is how uh, other parts of the world tastes, right? So I think uh, in that sense, I think they definitely are taking a stud uh, move by introducing this new texture and flavor of coffee. But I do agree with Salim that it is very gimmicky. Um, it's not something you think of. Like, you know, when you think of the pink drink, you do think of coconut water base. Uh, or when you think of vanilla with um, with espresso, like that just feels to go well together. Olive oil and coffee, just for whatever reason, just already makes the stomach hurt. So uh, I don't know if I'm, if I'm going to be... Uh, someone consuming it but i think it's a it's a cool move no look i agree with Samir. this is definitely on brand for starbucks and i do you know what i go back into is always the business model of this right like hey what does it cost to promote this product what does it cost to ship new product new new syrup into the stores right because this is not a product they have in stores right so if you're going to go promo this thing and spend millions of dollars on advertising all the oil and it's only going to give you a small amount of spite like you know core drinks these are all drinks that were Honestly, you already added in the store. You aren't adding new SKUs to the to the store level. So, how much of this is is going to cost you? Is it in the spike worth the worth the wild? Um, is my take on it. And yes, is it is it all bread for all for Starbucks to go figure out some new variation of coffee that they can bring to the market and charge more for? Of course, it is. That is what they do. Um, and and I would disagree with you, Adil. Um, you know, we everywhere I go, there's a Starbucks. It doesn't matter what country I'm in, and they're packed. There's a, like one of a kind Starbucks here in Paris. Like it's packed. Um, so they, they've got reach all around the world. I wouldn't think that they're only going to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> safe to say that it's if they're trying to appeal to a different type of target audience, right? Like this is not your your basic PSL type of people who are want to try this type of product, right? This is your your craft connoisseur coffee people like Salim who might be convinced one way or the other to try it one day. Uh, but I, I feel I feel like they're trying to get bigger in in a different way. They're trying to think beyond their store count or their reach or their audiences and their loyalty program. They're trying to get something more. And and they for some reason I, I feel like there's something there in this kind of craft coffee experience space. Um, and and I and I give them credit for exploring it. I think it's safe to say that this won't be the only thing that's going to be added to coffee in their innovation line. Like I'm fully expecting some crazy things in the future. Uh, to be added to their coffee that's going to argue for more better texture and flavor and whatever whatever the hell they're trying to pitch around this olive oil thing. But I think it's going to work. I think it's going to make people want to want to stick, uh, keep, keep Starbucks at the top of the mind and uh, really think of them as the the pioneer of of uh, craft coffee. I would love to see some masala chai on the Starbucks menu. Next, Italy's first, and then we're going to go to India, Pakistan. Let's do it. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'll take us to our next uh, our next utter stud. Uh, this one this one hits home. Uh, Lamborghini has sold its last full gas powered supercar. Uh, shocking as it might sound, the Italian brand is electrifying its entire lineup. It's starting out with uh, plug in hybrids, and then they do have plans for their first electric vehicle in a few years. Um, but from here on out, all new Lamborghinis sold will be electrified in some manner. Uh, and it was the CEO Stephen Winkleman that 
has claimed that this is an end of an era, which I fully agree on. Uh, the entire lineup will be hybrid by 2024, and the first pure EV model will launch in 2028. What do you guys think? Dud or stud? Adil, you want to go first? A total dud, guys. This is like not even a question. Um, so growing up, I don't know if you guys had posters of Ferraris and supercars on your walls. My dream car was like a Jaguar XJ220. It looks super futuristic. Something I grew up wanting to drive. Um, and now what's crazy is I, I drive a Rivian pickup and that can burn any market now. I think supercars have really missed the mark in advancement. Uh, they've they've really um, had this high expectation of what, uh, what their brand, uh, the tag value is, as well as, you know, the, how striking the look should be um, to demand the price they do. Um, so I have a lot of car enthusiast friends and I make this argument all the time that the sound of an engine and the feeling of like an internal combustion engine, like that can only go so far. Uh, I expect brands like Lamborghini, Ferrari, um, them to be at the forefront of technology and creating a, um, a $600,000 car that can only, it's a hybrid by the way. It's not the, the one, the first one that they're coming up with just a hybrid it's plug-in hybrid it's gonna have six miles of range let's i mean that's a joke it's a total joke six miles of range and six hundred thousand dollars an entry-level tesla y'all at thirty thousand dollars has more technology than the lamborghini does and i know you can say oh you don't buy lamborghini or for the technology but at some point that's what i mean what are you associating with right if you at many years ago uh, these supercars were known for the engineering that went into place for their engines, right? And you happen to get a really cool car. Now it's, what is all this worth? I mean, what is the $600,000 worth? I would love to have seen Lamborghini say, hey, forget electric, forget plug-in hybrid. We're going to go to hydrogen. We're going to go to blue fuel, right? And that was, that would have been a lot uh, bigger of a game changer. Um, so Lamborghini in, in all, I think overall has been very irrelevant. Um, you know, their counterparts have Formula One teams and Lambo has just been kind of twiddling thumbs and not really doing anything. If they really wanted to make an impact by saying, hey, we're going all in on electric, they would have had a Formula E team by now, right? They'd said that we're going to be the leader in this. But they're saying by 2028, we're going to be fully electric. That's still nothing like that's it's just it, it just feels like, you know, uh, it just feels really empty. So total dud, in my opinion. Look, I'm going to go I want to go stud, right, because here's what's going to happen. Right. I think you look at you look at Lamborghini. It is a Audi oh, Volkswagen company. This is a company wide initiative to go electric all across the board. And you look at the target audience for Lamborghini. It's no it's it's lack of a better word. It's the guy that can't buy the Ferrari. Cause he can't get in line or he can't get the queue to buy a Ferrari and buy a Lamborghini, right? So this is a organization that's got revenue generation possibility um, and, and going all electric to a, a, a target audience that is now trying to compete with the Teslas of the world and the other, uh, you know, e-cars. Literally, yes, the first car is going to be shit uh, from an electrical standpoint. They've got to learn this technology. They've got to go ground up uh, and build something, but they've got to go to market today, right? It's the it's the Tesla model back 10 years ago where you start to build the most expensive supercar, uh, electrical so that he could prove the point that, hey, this car is worth the while. So that's what they're going to do first. They're going to prove the car and then they're going to come back and say, hey, look, this is the next car and this is the next car. Um, and you're going to see that revenue generation go up, 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 and up. So I think instead of move because everybody's talking electric. It's kind of like talking about AI and chat GPT on, on the text run, right? It's 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 the next best thing. Um, everybody's talking about it, so they've got to get into that voice. Um, and with the uh, Look, there's an eco spin to this. There's a whole environmental spin that they can do to this. There's a lot of marketing that can be done to support an initiative like this uh, that Lamborghini's going for. So I think this is definitely a stud move. Uh, they've got a target audience that they're going to go find and say, hey, look, we're going to go buy these cars. We're going to go sell these cars. Uh, and again, uh, the other guys are doing it. There's no other electrical car. They're not doing it. Ferrari's got the hybrid. They've got some e-cars coming out, but uh, it's going to give them power going to be able to race and, and they're going to figure it out. Yeah, both good takes, guys. Like I, I hear you a deal that you know, Lamborghini going from being known as the future of cars to now being now playing from behind, right? Like they're kind of playing catch up a bit. Uh, and and Celine, to your point, I think Lambo has 
made the statement and now doubling down that the future of supercars is electric. And I think if Lamborghini wants to be known as the the leader in supercars once again, they're the ones who are going to have to double down in something, right? And it's they can't play kind of in this halfway space, have a half lineup that is combust engine or half that's not that's electric, right? They they kind of had to pick a lane. And I think I think it is right for the future of auto that the fu- that, that it should be an electric. And, you know, I could almost say that a lot of the auto brands that have leaned into electric, they sort of accidentally created high performance cars, right? Like, I feel like what we see from the performance of these EV models that are coming out where Tesla started with creating more of a democratized electric vehicle that everyone can really have access to. And they're super car performing, right? Like Tesla Model S, Plaid is is the fastest zero to 60 car in the market, even though it wasn't intended to be. These supercars are supposed to be high performing. So I would say like even t- Lambo is now realizing that their competitors are not just the top tier supercar brands anymore. It's, it's any EV car on the market who could potentially be competing to, against them in performance. And I think it's sort of redefining how we're going to be thinking about supercars moving forward. The supercars is not just going to be known for performance anymore. It's going to be a lot of other branding things that are going to have to come with it right and and lambo knew how to do it at one point uh, i think i'm really excited to see what what they end up taking it and um how the how the market responds uh but yeah sad to see though uh end of an era from lambo uh no more gas powered cars and their new lineup moving forward yeah lambo is uh is definitely still a beautiful car never going to take that away it just you know you can only ask for so much from looks when it comes to price tag uh, but talking about an entry level price tag, let's move on to Slurpee. So, what was y'all the uh, what was y'all go to flavor of Slurpee when y'all were kids? Uh, these are the watermelon flavor for one time, dude. I used to get that shit all the time. Uh, what um, my go to? But it was like limited, limited to fine. I was a Coke and cherry mix, and then once in a while, just doing the uh, the just kind of getting every single flavor possible, and then whatever concoction that made the messy, nasty looking fluid that would end up in the in the cup, but uh, that was, I would either go one way or the other. <laughs> What's that called? Like, is there ever something really? Suicide. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You, you guys are a lot more experimental. I was Coca Cola straight up. Um, and I, I loved it as a kid. I would get that and some hot Cheetos. And I don't know, I'm still alive today, surprisingly. But, um, but you know, let's talk about this new Slurpee rebrand. Seven Eleven has given a new look to the logo and um, the cup design all, all together uh, for its very famous Slurpee frozen drink as part of a wider campaign called Anything Flows. Um, it looks super refreshed and uh, it's definitely trying to appeal to a new generation of consumers uh, that is Gen Z. And um, let's let's you know start with the facts. It's a very striking campaign and striking new look so would love to debate this uh you know you guys have the link in front of you guys we went ahead and reviewed this in the pre-show but uh what do you guys think is this a dud or stud of a rebrand yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna start by giving 7-eleven a lot of credit for how they've pivoted their entire brand to be so uh fascinating to gen z i think we so it was always a surprise to see gen z loving convenience as a channel they'd love to shop there it's a high foot traffic area for them as a, as a consumer and, and 7-Eleven has fully embraced the things, the cultural things that, that Gen Z brings to the table. Uh, and Slurpee specifically, it's been around for 57 years. Uh, and honestly, like nothing, not, not much has changed in how it's looked. So I think it was a good call on, on the rebrand and choosing to have this refresh, but I'm sorry, this new logo missed a mark. Like it's a dud. I, I'm, I'm going to critique the art direction on the new logo and I'm going to say exactly what you guys are thinking. It looks like poop. And, and I get why they're leaning into S. It's, it's on brand. They, they want to keep that little dollop somewhere. But come on, guys, like you're, you're a food product and you know that your logo cannot look like the poop emoji. They, they've, they've rebranded the Slurpee into the Slurpoo and, and no one's going to not see it anymore. And, and I don't know if it's, it's not going to create any appetite feel for me. This is supposed to be like an impulsive thing. I'm going to go into a 7-Eleven. I'm supposed to crave Slurpee. I'm not going to crave it anymore. If you're going to, if I'm going to see this S everywhere in the store, on the cup, I'm sorry, but I, just looking at the art direction, can't, I can't take it. Yeah, I can't unsee the the poop emoji. Celine, what do you think though? Dude, I can totally rock that t-shirt. Can you get that Slurp logo S, throw an A-L-I-M in there, have a name on it, game. Okay. Look, 
with, with, I'm going to let some of feet on the art direction, right? Because, yeah, there's there's some creativity work that could be done. But I think I think it's got enough of the nostalgia artistic part of it that, uh, that'll that that'll drive the, the business that it needs. But also, I think the biggest uh, notion here is that the, the departure from Slurpee and 7-Eleven as one brand, right? So Slurpee's trademarked on its own. It's got its own logo. It's got its own uh, brand identity now. And this is a a business revenue for for Slurp for Slurpee and Seven Eleven as a whole, right? They can now spin this off and uh, go into other stores, not Seven Elevens. It could go into the cans. You can go get a Slurpee can uh, in the future. It's not happening now, but I, I can see how this can become its own beverage business, right? We talked about beverages a couple uh, a couple episodes ago, and and celebrity you know celebrity brands coming out with their own beverages because it is a business. It is a profitable business. So uh, I agree that uh, you know the art direction maybe could use some work, but I don't think it's that bad, uh, honestly. I think give me rock, but from a business standpoint, this is phenomenal, right? Splitting away from Seven Eleven, be able to go market itself as its own brand, um, away from Seven Eleven as its own strong brand, right? You might see some of it here, but you go overseas, man. Seven Eleven is huge, and this is just another product for them to go sell and trademark, and they've got other products in that queue as well. So, I think it's a stud move. Good job, Seven Eleven and Slurpee. Yeah, I think my final thoughts on this is that. Um... I'm so glad they didn't take the nostalgic approach for their uh, ad campaign. Now, I, I can totally imagine someone who wanted to say, oh, let's appeal to the millennials who are now parents and see if they want to go with their kids to 7-Eleven and, you know, make it a, 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 you know, a cute father-son moment or father-daughter moment or something like that. I'm glad they didn't take that approach because that that can only get you so much reoccurring business. Um what they went really hard on was Gen Z. They wanted something striking. And I think they knew what they were doing with the logo too, Samir. Like if th no, there's no way no one thought about that in their review process, right? When they're reviewing logos and stuff, they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were picking. And here we are talking about it. So I think they're, um, they went all in on, on capturing 7-Eleven uh, you are right. Uh, you know, GoPuff and everything has made convenience sort of back uh, like cool again, right? And getting something on the go is is cool again. And Seven uh, Eleven is going to get that foot traffic from Gen Z just because of this. And Salim, really cool take that I I would have never thought about this to be a packaged goods, but now I can yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm going to take it as great strategy. The creative execution could have been a little bit better. But I think I think we all agree that the the strategic I'm, as the strategist person that's the only thing I'm looking for. It's a good move, but uh, I just wish I I don't see I don't I don't want to see the poop emoji anymore. I'm sorry. We gotta we gotta do an episode where we just talk about all the rebrands and say, hey, look, which rebrand works, which rebrand doesn't work. Yeah. Well, uh, I have the honor this week of taking us through uh, our ad champagne. Um, there is a link to uh, the ad that we're we're gonna be talking about. Um, but specifically wanted to talk about France's uh, women's soccer team ad um, that was launched uh, last week or a couple of days ago. Uh, and soccer fans were, were buzzing about this World Cup ad. Uh, it, it's honestly, I feel like it's being in the conversation for one of the best sports ad in history. And when we talk about sports ads, that is a, that is a high list, a high caliber list uh, of ads that are out there. Uh, it's a two minute ad that appears to show a display of these magical soccer skills from the France men's team. Uh, from giving headers to curling free kicks by Mbappe, Griezmann, and others. Uh, high intensity, crowds are cheering, everything you would want to feel from, from an exciting soccer play by one of the best soccer teams in the world. Then comes the twist. Uh, a message that reads, only Les Bleus can give us these emotions. Les Bleus meaning the men, the men's team. But that's not, that's not them that you've just seen. And then the footage rewinds a bit, and then the video editing process starts to get revealed showing that the skills and goals that you just saw are actually all of those of the women's players, uh, including Sakina Karchui, uh, Selma Bacha. Uh, they are superimposed France's men's team's players onto fe France's female players. Uh, after the actual highlights from the France women's teams are, are revealed and played, the final word changes from B-L-E-U-E-S uh, from the masculine way to the feminine way to reference that what you just saw was the women's team. It's a fantastic commercial uh, that really challenges people's perceptions of a women's soccer. I highly recommend you guys take a look. Two minutes of it, you would think it's gonna, you're gonna lose your attention, but the intensity that they've brought uh, into that kind of kept you engaged the whole time. 
And when you get to that kind of that oh shit moment in the middle of it, uh, you just can't you just can't kick your eyes off of it. Uh, such a positive message uh, for female soccer, uh, an incredibly powerful ad that I think made everyone really talk about it. That I think was completely phenomenal. Yeah, I, I can't agree more, man. This uh, it was a beautiful ad. Uh, the fact that they could keep uh, everyone's attention for two minutes, I agree with you. That's remar remarkable. Um, and you know, the first half you are thinking that oh, this is a cool ad, just a compilation of clips from the guy players and stuff and then the you know the bait and switch really uh so that's what hooks you in obviously um but it definitely doubled double downs on the uh the stigma and you know the fact that society does favor men's sports so that was part of the expectation of the first half and everything which is really good um i think there was a it reminded me of another video that went viral this weekend uh demar de rosen famous NBA star, all-star from the Chicago Bulls, uh, was was shown taking pictures of his daughter and WNBA players. So he was the one taking photos of his daughter standing with WNBA players. And even he wants his daughter to have female athletes as their heroes. Um, I think, you know, it's it definitely pulls a, at my heartstrings. I'm... Um, I'm a girl dad, but also I'm a soccer coach uh, for my daughter as well. So something like this is, definitely motivates me more to go take her to more uh, women's soccer sport or you know games. And uh, Dallas has a WNBA team. We got to you know now I'm motivated to go to more of that just from this one commercial. So great job. You no, know, I agree. You know we uh, it's interesting to see because we don't see a lot of women. And this is a couple of times that we've seen soccer campaign come out that that's focused on women nike's done one in the past as well um it's an exposure that keeps getting left behind we've seen battles in the u.s about you know equalizing the pricing and the and the pay structure because it's they, they do better uh, as a team sometimes uh, than the american than the boys do uh here friends right now it's interesting to see we were we were you know walking the streets to get jerseys and we saw the the, the St. Germain jerseys, which of course that's famous here. We saw the light blue jerseys and we were trying to figure out which jersey they were and that's new because even the guys are like, that's the women's jerseys. So seeing actual women jerseys in store was was pretty cool uh, because it's rare you see those uh, from a marketing standpoint because nobody's buying them. Uh, but I think this is a great move from a marketing campaign to get more women excited. Uh, there's just a big outburst of in, in uh, Brazil recently as well for women's soccer. Um, I think this is a good chance to promote uh, women's sports, um, and we got to give them more exposure that we need. Um, girl dad here as well, and you know I love seeing the ability to go showcase you know straw women, um, building you know great sports sports level athletes. I'm sorry, it's 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 there. We just got to get them the exposure they need. Um, we'll have some fun watching them as well. I love that. Awesome. Uh, well, let's get into our our final segment in the brands to watch. Um, my my choice this week uh, is Liquid Death. And if you haven't heard of this tiny tiny brand that's not doing much, um, they are really breaking ground on so many different spaces. If you really think about water, uh, it is a relentlessly marketed category, right? You got brands that are water that's smart, water that's from exotic places like Fiji or the French Alps, there is premium luxuriness to it, right? It sort of feels like a designer handbag uh, of bottled beverages. And and water is always kind of played into the purity message, the natural, you got pH balance, you got where it's from, right? The filter, there's the electrolytes. There's so much that goes into talking about the, the product itself and trying to make it feel what water is supposed to feel like. Um, until, until Liquid Death came around uh, and its founder, Mike Cesario, uh, really sense that something was missing. Uh, and and he asked, how do we make the healthiest thing you could drink just as fun as beer? Literally for, for like kind of pretending that you're a beer company. And and that's where Liquid Death plays. It's it's water that's sourced from Austria, uh, but it's packaged like tall boys, dressed with skulls. It has the buzz of an energy drink. It appeals to males, who's about half the market in a female-dominated space. Uh, and it, it's water with this heavy metal swagger um, that, that promotes aluminum cans. That's supposed to be better for the environment. Uh, the brand has meaning, its purpose, its entrance into this kind of fun club. Uh, and it's just infused with humor and culture uh, that I think is exactly the, the kind of thing that you expect to see in this category. When everyone goes right, you go left. And Liquid Death found so much success doing that. Their motto 
is Murder Your Thirst. Murder Your Thirst is one of the fastest, if not one of the, the fastest water beverage brand in the country right now. Uh, they have $3 million in sales when they launched in 2019. And now they're going to go public next year at a $700 million valuation. This is massive blow up in a category that we all felt pretty saturated, right? Like it, water is water. And what made Liquid Death really unique is that they embraced the truth. And that is that people are smarter than you think. That you can't keep fooling people about water. Water is water. And a lot of brands really play into the, the idea that people are just generally dumb and that they'll believe these kind of purity messages and that the water coming from exotic places is somehow better for you or whatever better hydration is supposed to mean. Liquid Death just completely went the other way with it. And, and everyone's really embraced it. I love just how it's kind of being a part of culture. I love the direction that it's headed. Um, I think it's a kind of the fresh type of take on marketing and branding that, that gets people like us excited. Uh, when you see a brand that goes completely zig to the zag uh, and win. Um, so that's my brand to watch this week. I love Liquid Death. I've uh, been drinking it for um, for quite some time now. It's actually, you're right, it does, uh, it's great for a bar scene. Uh, you know, I, I usually will will get that. And, uh, you know, that's that's been my go-to uh, whenever I'm out with friends and stuff now too. Yeah, I think it's a great product. I think they finally designed the water that's appealing to the crowd, right? You've got two different variations of uh, of water today, but here's here's uh, you know this heavy product that you can easily order. Uh, it doesn't make you feel out of place, um, but as well as uh, it's got the you know the excitement and the marketing behind it to make it feel like it's a it's a good drink to have, and enhancing the idea of just you know water is better for you. So great product to watch. If you're not watching it, you haven't tried it yet. Of course, it tastes like water. Uh, the unsparkling one too. Sparkling one's pretty good too. This week's web brands to watch. Look, I'm I'm out in France, uh, in Paris to be exact. Uh, it is only right for me to pick a brand that's local here, up and coming here. And and guys, I gotta tell you that my wife would be standing in line for a handbag. Uh, actually, yeah, it's a 45 minute walk. There's like one store in this place called Pauline. You haven't heard of this? This is a you know very simply aesthetic brand uh, with a, a very fine leather, uh, which is a very reasonable price. $300, between $200 and $300, and that's kind of their thing. And it fits right into that quiet luxury look that is kind of trending now. And you, have you ever seen that TikToker, um, I want to say his name is, uh, we'll have to look him up, but the TikToker, Tanner, basically cuts up these high luxury brands, uh, leather pieces on TikTok, and basically, you know, opens up Louis Vuitton or Chanel's or the, the Dior's of the world and says, hey, look, this brand is a great product, but probably the leather is worth 50 bucks. Um, and Everything else is you're paying for the brand, you know, the ten thousand dollar Hermes bag that's probably you know fifty dollars in material and a hundred dollars for the craftsmanship. Uh, this is the guys that are, are breaking that market. They're brand new, they're pretty new. They're local here in France, but there's only one store here in France. I think there's two stores globally right now. You can order them online though. Um, but people are lining up. Nowhere near any of the bigger brand stores. They're 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 selling out, dude. And people have lined up for the store. It's full. They've got bags to sell. Um, great product, minimal, very easy to look at. Um, and again, just hurt the pocket as hard as the other ones do. So uh, if you haven't checked out Pauline yet, check out Pauline. It's a, it's a good brand to watch. So is it their own location or it, uh, do they, uh, did you guys go into a boutique to buy it? It's their own boutique. They don't sell anywhere else. They don't, uh, they don't sell it to the new markets of the world or, or those yet. It's their own boutique. Uh, they kept it that way. The owner wants it that way. I have a few, I have a few, while I was waiting, I uh, had a chance to talk to one of the staff members, uh, and that's what they were telling me. is like, look, they've, uh, they're, they're trying to keep it this way. They're trying to uh, minimize costs so they can keep the cost of the product as where it is today, right? They don't need to overhype the price. Um, so it becomes affordable luxury. Has your wife heard of uh, Jack Moose? Yeah, yeah. We saw a couple of Jack Mooses as well. I love this new trend that's happening. It's like quiet luxury is coming in. Um, so I'm definitely going to check out Pauline. That's great. Jack, yeah. Moose is, uh, Jack Moose is making a scene. They're not, I don't know how quite under Jack Moose's because lately I don't know if you've seen the ad campaign from Jack Moose's run that thing is like rolling on like skater or skaters in, in, in Paris and stuff like Jack Moose is, is making noise yeah but also very very new very very trendy very very simplistic I love that that affordable luxury but valuing the quality still right and I think yeah. I think it's good for consumers right you're going to see products like these and brands like these pop up here and there it's going to put pressure on everybody to, to deliver a better quality product at a with a good experience without without breaking the bank 
I think that's good for everybody. I'm going to uh, take my shoe off real quick. One second. Ugh. All right. So, have you guys seen these before? Looks like a if you're listening and you're not watching our YouTube, I'm holding up a foam loafer. Uh, yes, it does kind of resemble a croc. Um, there's holes in it and it's, it's definitely different very colorful, right? Multicolored. Uh, but this is called cane footwear or the brand is called cane footwear. These are just referred to as canes. It's a single skew company. So of course they have, no, I'm, I, let me clarify. It's a single, uh, style company. So they only do this one style, um, in multiple colorways and everything, but it is killing it. Uh, so I have been a user for a few months now and I bought them for my wife, uh, bought it for my parents and my sister. Uh, and I think it's a phenomenal brand to watch. Uh, they basically took a croc and, uh, they upgraded it. So something that Lamborghini <laughs> never did with the, <laughs> with the wonderful technology, uh, Kane is doing that with dudes. Um, they're taking uh sugar cane from Brazil and using injection mold technology and in one injection mold uh with very minimal amount of water being making a shoe uh it's super sustainable it's uh just and it's extremely comfortable i mean what they've done in terms of utility is phenomenal crocs still get this like i don't know if you guys ever wore them i wore like one um back in the day and i, I don't think i ever touched them again the, your feet get sweaty. They just feel gross and you, you never look cool wearing them, no matter what anyone says. Uh, they basically take in, in uh, that foam and made a really cool loafer out of it. Um, they've already partnered with multiple colleges and they've uh, collaborated with uh, up and coming brands uh, like Spartan Race and Legends and Equinox. Um, they're doing a lot more in terms of collaborations and special colorways. Uh, what makes them really interesting though is their dedication to sustainability uh so we know Allbirds was really big on that and you know raised all this money and just kind of become a flop of a company in many ways canes is uh taking everything that Allbirds said they were going to do and is actually doing it so they have a really cool circular fashion program so if i was to give these canes back i get money off my next pair of canes and uh they make their own company they don't send it anywhere else they uh will make uh yoga mats and uh other comfort mats out of it uh which is really really cool i had reached out to them i was like i've already bought so many pairs from you guys and can, like i want to buy some more colorways can i get a discount code or something and they basically said no and not even in a nice way they're just like you were not going to do that uh, and then they raised their price was five bucks, like literally the next week. And so they know what they're worth is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, it's definitely, I, I wear them all the time. I wear them to work and I never feel weird wearing them. Uh, as if I was to wear Crocs, I definitely would feel weird. So check out Kane footwear. I think they're going to be the next brand to watch. I like the, I like that doing one thing really, really well. And you, you can win with that formula, right? I feel like that a lot of brands feel the need to have to innovate and, kind of expand their lineup to try to fit different needs, different people. Um, I hope they stick to it. I, I love it. I love the style. I think it looks really cool. Um, and, and good to hear that they're also comfortable. Like it's a quality product that it's not just a, a cool looking shoe, which I feel like there's plenty of shoes out there that do that, but they don't serve the the need. They don't deliver on the quality, uh, but awesome stuff. I, I love, I love that story. I'm definitely gonna look into it. Well, same here. I think it's a good story to look at. Um, I haven't, looked, haven't checked them out yet. And that's what I see from your, from your, from your camera looks pretty legit yeah they, and they're really cool um i think guys this was a great episode we talked a little bit about um some cool campaigns going on some duds and suds of that uh, i definitely think lamborghini still missed the mark that's my personal opinion uh but you know uh slurpee did something super cool on the flip side and um you know a lot of people have asked us ever since we've launched on you know what we're why we're doing this and what we're really hoping to achieve we don't know what we're trying to achieve. All we do know is that we see the world a little differently. Uh, the three of us, you know, we all, and the whole world is experiencing branding and campaigns all the time. And they may not even realize it, but, you know, 
Samir, Salim, and I just think about it a little bit more than the average person. And so we enjoy talking about it. We enjoy getting together and, and doing this. So we're having a blast. And, you know, we thank you for uh, supporting us doing this. Continue to give us uh, feedback and let us know what um, what you guys would like to see us discuss. I think the Lamborghini one was a suggestion from someone too. So thank you for listener, whoever sent that in. Uh, but with that being said, let's uh, sign off. Stay fabulous, guys. Yeah. John Mad. Mad Men. Yo, Mad The man's mad. Mad Men. I'm mad.